In the Four Corners region of the Southwest lies Mesa Verde National Park, a park which contains some of the most exceptional examples of a single isolated era of architecture. Everywhere in this vast expanse, piles of collapsed villages are found on terraces whenever there's a source of water nearby. But around the turn of the 13th century, people began moving down from the mesas into the canyons, and the construction of pueblos evolved into cliff dwellings that were built under the overhangs in the canyon walls. These cliff dwellings are astonishing in their formal complexity and range in size from a single fortified wall to the enormous 223-room cliff palace at Mesa Verde National Park in Colorado. Cliff Palace was constructed and occupied during the last few decades of the 13th century. Now, 700 years has passed since these structures were last occupied, and the explanation for their existence paints a violent portrait of a climactic disaster. A drought came in 1276. But they, these people had been through droughts before. And so we had people coming down from the San Juan Mountains. Uh, they couldn't survive any longer up there. Others to the west were facing other droughts. Suddenly, you know, they migrated this way. Suddenly Mesa Verde is the place to be, but with not enough resources to sustain them. And these people know what the consequences are uh, when facing those kind of calamities. Cliff Palace at Mesa Verde because of its sheer size alone, is an engaging example of formal interplay. Asymmetrical squares and rectangles play themselves out as room blocks and grain stores, while the circles are reserved for the submerged ceremonial spaces known as kivas. Found throughout ancestral Pueblo and architecture, this duality is something I consider beautiful, but it's also a powerful discourse on survival. The rectangular towers were constructed for the storage of grain, and the prayers responsible for rain were reserved for the cylindrical kivas. And not an insignificant part of every kiva. That's the spirit hole or spirit entrance, or we often use the term, uh, the Hopi term, sipapu. Sipapu means navel. A lot of Puebans believe in a umbilical cord connection or tie to the other place that they believe they came from. And it also represents an actual geographic location. It's a real testament to the people uh, living now that not only their dwellings are still uh, standing. Also, there's social structures, too. Structural changes in these dwellings, almost all of them, where it suggests that there's two groups living side by side um, and it's separated, and probably to keep the power and concentrate. So this is a pretty good effort to keeping the peace, it seems. And plus, we have lots of storage space, lots of canvas, but why? And what defines the function of a building if people no longer use it for its intended purpose? The archaeologists regard Mesa Verde as a spiritual and administrative center for the ancient Pueblo and culture, administered by a people who understood the consequences of not preparing for a drought. You know, the building epic in the ancient Southwest coincides with a 500-year period of exceptional climactic change globally, with centuries-long dust bowls followed by short shifts of heavy rainfall. Known as the medieval warm period, it culminated in the worst drought of its era and was followed by a sustained wet period and a general stabilization of climactic conditions. And around the same time, the residents of Mesa Verde abandoned this place. To the right, I guess, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's just a portion of some of these stones. You know. 600 years later, their heights up in the cliff face have kept them from eroding into the desert floor, and now the ruins of Mesa Verde are part of a national park. One of the travel guides I read called it the Disneyland of archaeology because formerly impassable canyons are now accessible by a series of asphalt paths and rustic-looking ladders. There's a gas station in the park and a gift shop, of course. They keep the survival mechanisms like Cliff Palace frozen in time, but in the absence of the daily rituals that generated them. Today, over a million tourists a year are lured to Mesa Verde by the exoticism of ruins, lured by an architecture of spectacle. But what's really interesting, though, is that this could also be a suitable assessment for the Chapel in the Rocks back in Sedona. 
The chapel was designed in 1957 by sculptor Marguerite Brunswick Stoud, with Anshin and Allen noted as the architects of record. For almost 20 years, the church served a series of congregations in and around Sedona, but in the mid-70s, ministries often moved out when the congregations grew too large for the structure to handle. Eventually, attendance declined, worship services faded, and the Christ was removed from the altar and confessionals were suspended. Finally, the decision was made not to hold any more regular services at the chapel, and current policy won't even allow wedding services. It sat abandoned for a while, but the chapel finally reopened when someone had the brilliant idea to clean up the place and put a gift shop in the old priest quarters in the basement. And suddenly, in the absence of the holy rituals that created the building, people started showing up, lured here by the architecture. They took pictures, lingered around, and bought the holy trinkets downstairs. Then what exactly is this building? It has no regularly scheduled services. There's no clergy present. No one to hear confessionals. No one to offer the Holy Sacrament. Now if in 700 years archaeologists restore the abandoned ruins of this place, will the sign out front refer to it as a Christian church? Or as a gift shop? Maybe those were the decision makers or had some, some prominence here in these dwellings. So where did they get the building material? Where did they get the... They ordered these stones. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Depot. Right. Yeah, brought them on pallets and put them on the top. No, they uh, they had to go to the Mancus River, about four or five miles from here, and get harder stones, some quartz stone. Plus it's in a slope. You know. now, sure, there's a Disneyland-like atmosphere to Mesa Verde National Park, but only because the camping and lodging amenities are tip-top, and tourists like me are armed to the teeth with camera gear. The architecture is a time warp, spectacular, majestic, and alien as any good Hollywood soundstage. And personally, in terms of archaeology sites, I love that the Park Service Ranger bears a resemblance to the Scott Bakula character on the TV show Quantum Leap. But the lingering question for me has always been why the structures were never occupied again. Climactic change explains why the structures were abandoned, perhaps even why they were no longer useful to the people who built them. Around the same time as their abandonment, the climate that necessitated them entered a prolonged period of stabilization that by most accounts seems to be coming to a halt. So perhaps the structures were never abandoned, but rather they're simply laying dormant, machines for the survival of a people who know they haven't seen the last epic of disastrous climate change and know that probably a time will come when they'll need them again. When I visit a building, I'll strip it of its function when I'm only concerned with its formal characteristics. Sometimes I think this is a privileged perspective on buildings, something developed in architecture school and reserved for architects. But in the case of Cliff Palace and the Chapel in the Rocks, for the most part, me and the tourist are one and the same. We're all here to see the architecture for the architecture, here to witness a spectacle stripped of function, gawk at it like sculpture in a garden, and maybe learn a thing or two. And once I get into Denver, I'm gonna pay a visit to a building that makes a spectacle out of a pile of scrap metal. But before that, I'm gonna pay a visit to the Denver Art Museum, by Daniel Liebskind. This land is your land. 